Resuming debate, uh, the Honourable Member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Oh, Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to rise on behalf of the democracy defending constituents in the autumn colored riding of Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Today, we're debating a sub amendment to the amendment of the motion. That's about as parliamentary a sentence one could say in this chamber. This motion calls for the Standing Committee on Procedure and House Affairs to complete a report to this government's green slush fund scandal. The amendment adds some witnesses along with the sub-amendment, but really Parliament is what this debate is truly about. Parliament and this government's contempt for parliamentary democracy. Exposing government corruption is a core function of Parliament. As one of the longest serving members in Parliament, I have seen off a few governments. There's a natural tension between a government and any Parliament, but this government is different because this Prime Minister is different. Never before have we had a Prime Minister who openly stated his admirations for the Communists who control China. It's not unlike the praise former Liberal Prime Minister Mackenzie King gave Adolf Hitler. Writing in his diary, the former Prime Minister described meeting Hitler. He wrote that he had, a personally, he had personally praised Hitler for, quote, the constructive work of the regime, end quote. Now, this current Liberal Prime Minister said, quote, there's a level of admiration I actually have for China because their basic, basic dictatorship is allowing them to actually turn their economy around on a dime and say, we need to go green. We need to start investing in solar, end quote. Liberals like Mackenzie King were enamored with the, how the National Socialists turned the German economy around on a dime following the Great Depression. Both past and present Liberal Prime Ministers seem to forget what prevents them from simply waving their hands and issuing orders like a king is democracy. This isn't just a, a couple of Prime Ministers who admire dictators for their good looks and nice socks. These Liberal men were praising dictatorships for their dictatorial policies. If that were the end, if this had just been one comment, one time, most people would have forgotten it. Yet remarkably, this Prime Minister seems almost maniacal in his commitment to proving his critics correct. He heard the expression, don't judge a person by what they say, judge them by what they do, and took it to heart. This Liberal's refusal to, Liberal government's refusal to obey an order from Parliament is just the current thing they're not doing. When sports leagues began shutting down in March of 2020 and this government decided to follow the lead of the NHL, the first instinct of this government was to grab as much power as it could. They sought to rule without restoring Parliament for two years. When that was quickly rejected... I have point of order, the Honourable Member for Waterloo. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I know you provide a lot of leniency, but we are on a sub-amendment moved by the Conservative on a question of privilege. Um, following an amendment moved by the Conservatives on a question of privilege that all members pr um, support in this chamber. So I would just like the member to get back on topic so that we can actually advance the matter at hand. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On that point of order, the Honourable Member for uh, Calgary, Rocky Ridge. Um, on the relevance issue, uh, one that I care deeply about, I, I will note that um, you have permitted uh, the member from Winnipeg North and many others to repeatedly ask questions unrelated to the motion. So the, you've already granted extraordinary latitude uh, in this debate. So I, I point that out. If we are going to narrow the speeches, we're going to have to narrow the questions. Yep. I, 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 appreci I appreciate the, uh, the, uh, the point of order on that. And I just uh, call on all members to maybe tighten up a little bit and uh, We'll, we'll try our best to uh, stick to the sub-amendment to the privilege motion that we're debating today. The Honourable Member for Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke. When that was quickly rejected, they still kept parliamentally hobbled for months, and that's how it's related. Recall the biggest scandal of the time was this Prime Minister's decision to hand a billion dollars to a couple of guys who had hired his mom to give some speeches. Those well-connected Liberals from We Charity with their billion-dollar made-up program were to give money out to applicants, just like the Green Slash Fund. Liberals giving money to Liberals to hand out to favoured interest groups sure sounds like a familiar scandal to me. But we'll come back to Liberal corruption in a bit. Because I mentioned in the beginning of my speech, this motion, motion isn't really about Liberal corruption as much as it is about this Liberal government's contempt for democracy, and in particular, this Prime Minister's disdain for it. 
the praising of murderous dictators was alarming, but for me, the day the Prime Minister assaulted two members of the opposition on the floor of the chamber is one that should never be forgotten. Much of the media focused on the Prime Minister's inadvertent assault on a member of the NDP. Here was a so-called feminist Prime Minister elbowing a woman in the breast. That's the kind of man bites dog story the media has always loved. What everyone just glided over was the actual and intentional assault on our dearly departed colleague, Gord Brown. For Canadians who don't recall the first time a prime, this Prime Minister attacked another member on the floor of the House of Commons, I'll recap. We were all in the chamber for a vote. Before a vote, the government whip and the opposition whip will walk down the centre aisle here to check to see if everyone's... We have here. another point of order, the Honourable Member for Waterloo. Mr. Speaker, I know that Conservatives have no regard for this institution or democracy, but I would just ask the member to get to the question of privilege. We're discussing privilege, privileges most Canadians don't have. We have a lot of important work to do, and she is recounting history, which there's a time and place for. This question of privilege, this sub-amendment, the Conservative sub-amendment to this question of privilege is not the place. Can you please just ask her to have a little bit of regard and respect for this institution and to get on topic? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On that same point of order, the Honourable Member for... Uh, no? Okay. Uh, I, was figuring, I figure we're going to go back and forth on these things. Uh, well, just to, just a reminder, just to, to flow it back as best we can. The Honourable Member for uh, Renfrew nipissing Pepper. Well, on that day, the NDP were acting a little silly. They were lightheartedly trying to delay the vote by blocking Gord from coming down the aisle. The NDP were not being out of line or in any way aggressive. Anyone who knew Gord knew he could stick handle his way past any opponent if he wanted to. But that's not what the Prime Minister saw. He saw the, the NDP blocking his agenda. He grew impatient. He left his chair, crossed the floor, a floor which is uh, at two sword lengths for a reason. This is meant to symbolize that we value the debate over physical conflict. The Prime Minister crossed that symbolic floor, grabbed Gord, and pulled him through the, the crowd of MPs. In the process, he elbowed NDP MP in the breast. The Prime Minister of Canada had physically assaulted two opposition members because he was impatient with parliamentary democracy, just like he is now. That should have been the end of him as Prime Minister, but apparently that's not disqualifying for these Liberals. Had the Liberal backbench the courage they could have removed him then, that would have spared them the optics of kicking out Canada's first Aboriginal Attorney General from her job for not following the Prime Minister's order to obstruct justice. Had they acted then, Canada might have had a Prime Minister who read his briefing notes about the Communists he admires interfering in democracy, and that's what these documents relate to. Instead, they sat on their hands and watched passively as scandal after scandal revealed their Emperor had no clothes, except for his pretty socks. And this shouldn't surprise anyone. Too often I've heard Liberal MPs refer to the Prime Minister as their boss. That comment alone tells you how upside down the Liberals see democracy. This is well understood in other Westminster-style parliaments, but these Liberals clearly need it explained to them in simple terms. The leader of a party is not the boss. Your constituents are the boss. You work for them. The leader works for you. And that's how parliamentary democracy is supposed to work. Instead, these Liberals have handed all their power to the Prime Minister and his powerful PMO. Now this Prime Minister is rubbing their faces in it. This Prime Minister keeps finding himself in contempt of Parliament because he has nothing but contempt for Parliament. But it's not just Parliament. Something about uh, this serving Prime Minister makes former Cabinet Ministers want to bear their soul in the form of a tell-all book. It's almost a form of seeking absolution for the sin of it enabling this Prime Minister. What's alarming is how much of these books reveal about the aloof, incurious, and arrogant Prime Minister. More alarming is that nothing has changed, and every member of the Liberal Party knows it. They see firsthand how he manages caucus. Not once have I ever heard them speak about his democratic approach to party management. Canadians heard how the Prime Minister talked about being a party leader last week. He talked as if he had all the power and the caucus was merely there to be disposed of when convenient. Now, we ourselves here are debating this sub-amendment, but this isn't really a debate. This is an order from the House of Commons. 
Just like the cover-up of the infiltration of communist agents in the Winnipeg lab, this government is refusing to follow an order given to them by the elected representatives of 41 million Canadians. The government has tried everything to prevent the release of the documents. If it, it had even tossed in the kitchen sink, they, they did so with the Charter. Only a Liberal would claim that well-connected Liberals have a Charter right to steal your money. Mr. Speaker, they can claim whatever they want. It, it doesn't change the fact that they're ignoring an order from the House. In doing so, the government showcases their contempt for Parliament. But it's not only their contempt for Parliament that's showing. By withholding documents demanded by Parliament, they're showing contempt for their own members. Each of them ran on a platform. And we'll disagree with that platform strongly. And we'd be happy to keep that platform off the House of Commons agenda until the next election. What's in those documents that is so damaging to the Liberal Party that it would abandon any future Liberal legislation if it means it can keep up the cover-up going a bit longer? Their position only comes more untenable the minute you think of it for even a second. Eventually, the government shall fall. Eventually, the people truly behind this scandal will be exposed. When that day comes, all of this obstruction by the Liberals will be for nothing. And what will they have to show for it? The only conclusion any reasonable person could reach is that there is more to this. And that's what happened at SDTC was just the tip of the Liberals' corrupt iceberg. And as I've pointed out previously, this scandal is nearly identical to the scandal at the local journalism initiative. The government gave 60 million hard-earned taxpayer dollars to a group of media lobbyists. Those media lobbyists, in turn, formed a committee whose job it was to hand out money to the local media in order to hire a local journalist. Five of those seven committee members handed cash out to their own companies. In order for a media outlet to receive funding for a local journalist, they must promise to hand over the content of the local journalist produces, free of charge, to the Newswire Canadian Press. Guess which committee the head of the Canadian Press sits on? Everybody in the legacy media knows about this corruption, but not a single one will report on it, even after being called out in the House twice. Before this government, the biggest knock against the legacy media was their liberal bias. Thanks to this Prime Minister, Canadians can add corruption to their list of media complaints. And that's not surprising. Everything this Prime Minister touches becomes tainted by him. Sustainable Development Technology Corporation started over 20 years ago and had been a rare government success story. But then this bunch did what they've done to so many Canadian institutions. They ruined it. And what's so egregious is it, this never should have happened. This government was warned. The former president at SDTC warned the minister not to appoint a person who had received funds from SDTC. That minister did it anyway. Now the organization's in shambles, and money's not going to qualified companies. Employees are demoralized because everything they touch becomes worse. How could it not under a prime minister who admires a basic dictatorship? <laughs> At the core of his authoritarian streak is an end that justifies means mentally. The Prime Minister sees jobs in his riding as an end, so he justifies obstructing justice and sacking an honest minister who got in his way. The Prime Minister saw a routine vote in the House of Commons as an end, so in the House of Commons as an end, so he just justified physically assaulting another member of Parliament. The Prime Minister sees handing out cash to well-connected friends as an end, so he justifies ignoring Parliament to keep doing it. What every member of the Liberal Party needs to ask themselves before their next caucus is when will they become the means to bring an end to this Prime Minister's misrule? And Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned earlier, the twin scandals with the Green Slush Fund and the Liberal Journalism Initiative are just the ones we can see from our side of the floor. We know this government hands out so much money so quickly with so few controls that it can fund a virulent anti-Semite to provide diversity training remotely 
from his home in Lebanon. Did anyone check to see if Laith Marouf uh, was on any of those evacuation flights? We know, we're the only, we're, we know that we are only standing at the base camp of a mountain of liberal corruption. This entire government's agenda since 2021 has been to create unaccountable pots of money for their friends. Every Canadian is receiving notices about increase in prices for streaming services. Spotify has gone up. Disney Plus has gone up. It, it, it actually goes up in November, according to the uh, finance minister. Of course, there are, are increasing prices to pay for the new streaming tax. Those tax dollars then go to a fund controlled by the Canada Media Fund. That fund is controlled by big telecoms who pushed hard for this streaming tax. Now those dollars will flow to well-connected groups handpicked by Bell, Rogers, and the Liberal Party. Some will trickle down to a makeup artist on the set of CBC's Next American cloned reality show, but most of it will end up in the pockets of Liberal-connected lobbyists. The Minister of Heritage surely knows what I'm speaking about. She is still listed as a lobbyist in the lobbyistry, lo, lobbyist registry. Talk about a well-connected Liberal. She went from lobbying for a streaming tax to implementing one. The Prime Minister doesn't need to dress up as a character from Star Wars again to put a, put a Jedi mind trick. He just puts waves in, he just waves his hands to the media and says, these are not all conflicts of interest you're looking for. Some believe this world sits on a turtle that sits on a turtle and, and that just, it's just turtles all the way down. In Canada, it's just well-connected liberals, stacked atop well-connected liberals all the way down to your wallet. But that's not the kind of Canada we want to build. Our party is looking towards the future. The Liberal Party stuck in the past with the ghost of Mackenzie King. They cling to a dying broadcasting corporations whose heyday was in the 60s. Their foreign policy would feel more comfortable wearing bell bottoms. Their race-based policies invoke an even older past. It shouldn't surprise anyone that the Liberals took this dark turn. This Prime Minister only came to rule them out of a mixture of desperation and nostalgia. He promised to make the Liberal Party great again, and they took the bait, hook, line, and sinker. Mr. Speaker, as I said at the outset, I've seen a Liberal Prime Minister's battle with Parliament before. What I've never seen is a Liberal Prime Minister who openly admired dictatorships for being ruthlessly efficient at tyranny. When we have someone as Prime Minister, for however long that may be, with a predilection for dictators surfing to power on a wave of nostalgia, who now ignores the will of Parliament, it should be setting off more alarm bells than it certainly is, it currently seems to be. Fortunately, Canadians can count on common sense Conservatives standing up for Parliament, and it's time to bring home democracy.